Hi. Um, cool. Hi, guys. Hi. Um, so, I'm going to talk a little bit about VR and AR today and immersive technologies. Um, I spoke to Brent and Luis some time ago about, you know, coming by and, and doing this. My background is, is in design and education. I ran an education company for five years before this, before this company. And basically, um, I, I run an education company before this, and and uh, we uh, decided to go into the VR space. So what we do is we basically help companies figure things out. We produce original content, but we also do expedition and immersion sessions with companies around uh, what the future of VR and AR is. This is some of the people we work with, and that previous day we worked with for the past five years. So, uh, Kevin Kelly is, is one of my favorite authors. Uh, if you guys haven't, I don't know who he is, you might want to check it out. Um, he, is, he is also the first, uh, founder of Wired Magazine. And what he talks about is very, very important here, where um, basically there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen really, really soon. And um, we pretty much don't know how to deal with it. So, um, you, may, you guys might have seen this curve. It's called a hockey stick curve usually, but uh, by the way, this is a great vlog if you guys haven't yes. um, read it. Um, he writes about SpaceX, Elon Musk, uh, Tesla, and so on and so forth. So right about here is where they say, well, maybe the singularity will happen, right? When the machines are gonna get smarter than us and either, right, they're gonna kill us or, or we're gonna learn how to live together. Um, so part of that, uh, they say a lot of this stuff that's going to happen is going to be about exponential technologies. VR and AR is, is one of them, right? So where the computing power increases uh, many folds and, and Moore's law will be no more possible. And um, I want to kind of talk about where that's heading with VR. So to understand these different mediums, right, VR, AR, MR, there's this guy who's really smart, his name is Paul Milgram, he came up with the virtual reality continuum. So it's basically a spectrum that, that says, okay, on one side we have reality, and then we have fake reality, which is virtual reality. There's stuff in between, too. And it's called mixed reality. It's basically, right, so mixed reality is, is, is when a device can see oh, there's a table there, let me use that in my software and put a toy on the table that doesn't exist, but the point is that the machine can see objects in the room, whereas augmented reality is basically Pokemon, right? You just see a stuff on your screen that has no idea what's, what the things are in the room. So it's just a helpful uh, piece to look at to kind of refer back to, to understand all of this. Um, Speaking of Pokemon, um, so the other part that's really interesting is is how we usually define technology. So we usually go, all right, so it was really big before, now it's really small, it's good, right? So it's, it, it's faster, it's smaller, it's Moore's Law that says it increases, it doubles every year and things get smaller. Um, but in our work, we sort of started thinking about a new definition of technology. And, and its meaning. And that new concept we sort of came up with is more on input, input to photon. So meaning, right, so right now you, you press a button on your phone, it goes into space, it comes back, and it produces a result that hits your eye, right? So the input from your finger to the photon hitting your eye could potentially be a new way to measure the progress of technology and it's very important to, to think about it that way in, in virtual reality. I'm going to tell you why. Because uh, we also see responses relationships. So if you think about, all right, so you get sick, um, you call five friends. Who's the first one to respond? Probably the person you have the closest relationship with. So similar to technology, right? Technology and our relationship with the machines are very much based on the response rate how faster it is or how slow it is. So 
back in the day, right, there was a huge terminal, you put something in and it took your eye, you know, you went home and then you got back, you got the results back. And then it was minutes, right, so the dial-up modem, we all love that. And now it's seconds with the phone going up into space, into the cloud and then coming back. But there is a huge, so it sort of was incremental and now with the VR and just the response to it input to photon, it just took a huge leap. Because if you think about it, right, so when you turn your head, the whole image needs to follow almost instantaneously. If it doesn't, your brain thinks something is wrong and you feel sick. That was the main technology uh, barrier that VR had before and it was solved. So now it's, it went from seconds to milliseconds really fast. And that's very important to understand and important to understand why we feel the presence that we feel and why we feel so close to a fake world that we know doesn't exist, but we still think it's there, right? So if you think about no response, zero response to super response, which potentially we're heading towards, like what does that mean for us in our lives, right? What does that mean in the workplace? And, and I think it, it, it means vulnerability, it means trust, it means better learning and better productivity something that an iPad can't do, right? something that the machines as we used to, is just we're getting so much closer to the machines is the point. And that's kind of the term we coined a little bit, is the machine intimacy. So again, closer, we're going to wear it on, on our skin, the iWatch, everything is really about machine intimacy, right? And now we have it on our faces. And this is a great quote, I think, um, that you know, for this, for the sake of this conference, is 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 important, right? That no significant learning occurs without a significant relationship, and that can be between the student and the teacher, but also between the machine and the human. So, what's the current landscape of of of, of the VR space? Uh, right, it's nothing new. It's been around for for decades. I mean, there's uh, this guy, right? So then, you know. 1800s, probably people were looking at stuff, stereoscopic stuff. This is wonky stuff from the 90s. Uh, Jerome Lanier was one of the first pioneers um, to, he coined the virtual reality term. This is actually his rig, and that's when people thought it was gonna be the craze back in the 90s, and it wasn't, right? Oh. So, and then he actually made people puke, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, the military have been using it for decades also, and this is uh, an F1 simulator, Hexapod, costs six million dollars or so and three thousand dollars an hour. So one of my partners is an IndyCar driver and they basically train all this. The point of all this, right, is that we know it works. So this is a study done in the 90s saying that, look, these guys prefer simulations plus real training over just real training. Um, so what happened was, right, also that the price of this technology pretty much was cut to a fraction because mainly of this guy, Palmer Lucky, he's in a bit of a controversy right now. But, uh, you know, in his garage, he basically invented uh, a way for your brain not to feel sick because he solved the latency problem, right? So you turn and it would follow you really time. The millisecond response, that's pretty much what he did. Uh, two years later, it was, uh, they were bought by Facebook for $2 billion. Um, another very important thing that happened, which people don't really talk about in VR, is, is uh, it's much easier to accelerate innovation and, and computing power with a smaller screen, right? So the focus of the computing power, the smaller the area, the easier it is. We're not gonna be able to do what we can do with the small screens on with big screens, right? It's just not uh, feasible uh, or, or desirable eventually because you know it's too much money and so forth and so forth. So what happened? And and in all the early headsets, you pretty much had a phone screen on your face, you know, so what you had in your pocket. So that was another very very important thing that 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 uh, you know Steve Jobs did, and purposely it's an iPhone one that I put in there because that's. Um, you know, that's what started the whole screen revolution that helped VR. Um, now Samsung is ramping up. I'm sure you guys have tried the Samsung Gear VR. They dream. Uh, Apple just patented their seventh patent. Um, HTC allocated $10 billion towards content development. Uh, Magic Leap, 
is, is a super secret uh, startup that raised uh, over a billion dollars. And if you guys haven't seen it, this is sort of their um, kind of like little promo. So supposedly, right, it's, 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 it's a mixed reality device, it's hardware, it's very, very good, years ahead of anything else that we've seen. Um, you can't really talk about it if you've seen it, you've signed your soul with an NDA, and, uh, you know, that's all we have. And then Pokemon Go, Microsoft HoloLens, uh, very important innovation. They've used the years of the Xbox Connect stuff that they made to pretty much build this thing. So you see cameras all over here, so it's in real time, it scans your room, and it really knows at every second of who's in the room, what's happening, where the objects are, and then it sends it to the CIA, maybe. Um, <laughs> or KGB. And I brought one here too, so you can try it later. And uh, also a very, very important thing for learning, especially analytics, right? So we could never, ever, ever before mention, you know, we had, had, we had uh, eye tracking for, for display and retail, like it never worked, you have to be in a position. But here we can literally see where someone's looking at each point of the experience, and that's gonna give us a whole new sets of data, right? And we're working with this uh, Canadian company that they pretty much drop a code, into the application uh, and it spits out heat maps of every point in the experience of the user. So, uh, projections, um, you know, AR is supposed to take over VR. Um, it's going to be billions and billions of dollars. Everyone's going to get really rich. Um, you know, usually projections, like it's not, not what happens. But uh, still, there's, there's too much capital invested for it to fail. Um, and this is really interesting, is that most of it is in gaming entertainment, not, none everywhere else, right? So we see this as an opportunity. Uh, because the gaming entertainment is the short-term gains, right? It's, hey, I'm gonna build an app, I'm gonna sell it for five ninety nine, and you know, I'm gonna make some money. This is, where, this is where this stuff is really gonna affect the next, sort of the future of how we interact with these machines. And that's where our main area of focus is education, health, and future work. So what does this all mean, right? Uh, NASA has a really interesting concept that they call telenauts, right? So they say, well, we're gonna go to Mars in 30 years and 40 years, right? There's astronauts are gonna be going, but actually, there's gonna be a hundred thousands of people going with them that are called telenauts. So through telepresence, it's gonna be so good that it's pretty much like you're going to Mars with astronauts. So it's a really fascinating concept, right, about that's gonna influence telemedicine, uh, any industry in, 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 you know, in, in, in training, work, whatever you wanna call it. So their on-site application that they built with the HoloLens, uh, with Microsoft, is, is very special. Basically, they said, look, we can't send scientists to Mars. It's very expensive, you know, they might die, and blah, 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 you know. Um, so let's bring Mars to the scientists. So the HoloLens pretty much uh, through photogrammetry and photos that the rover has taken on Mars has mapped out pretty much, if there's a rock there on Mars, I'm gonna put the HoloLens on and I'm gonna see the rock in front of me as it is, right? And then you're gonna put the HoloLens on in Singapore or New York and you're gonna see, and I'm gonna see an avatar of you and we're gonna see the same thing and we're gonna check out the same rock. So very, very important uh, step, and you can even go down to really small uh, sizes of stuff, like there's a drill site, there's a hole, right? So let's check it out. So another use case, uh, and this is uh, the only piece of work that, that, that we've done and we're talking about, but you know, we remember this, right? This is how we learned physics in school. Um, you know, super boring, um, arrows and stuff, and, and, and and it hasn't progressed in like 100 years. So we thought, how cool would it be to actually do this with uh, a real Indy car, right? The only way you can do that is in virtual reality because the way we think about it is, you know, in order to do something in VR, either it has to be too expensive, too dangerous, or, or impossible in the real world. This is all of the above. And um, basically, 
uh, we wanted to define the first use case for how students would learn about physics. Um, and like you can get close in IndyCar and feel the wind flow ever, right? But, but now you can. So we launched it with, with a school organization in, in LA. And uh, here are kids in Watts, which is the poorest massive code in California, testing sort of the first version of, of this educational technology. Um, same thing with, right, this is how we taught science in universities. Kind of like look, looks the same now. Um, but what if it could look like this? And this is the Mars application I was telling you about the on-site. So this guy, Alex Kipman, he's pretty much the inventor of the HoloLens, sees this in front of them. And this guy, Jeff Norris, is the head of NASA's um, ops that builds this stuff with Microsoft, uh, is actually hologramic in here. And that's what we showed to the kids too. So they, we said, hey kids, you want to learn about Mars? Let's not look at it in books. Let's, not, you know, let, let's go there. So um, high level stuff that, you know, how work will be done in a few years. Actually, while we're doing it right now, like, you know, architecture, um, you can manipulate stuff uh, in real time between different people uh, and see stuff in three dimensions. And uh, the big brands are all jumping on this. So GE has invested a lot of money into this. Um, and, and, you know, basically the, the, the point of it is, if you can save a worker five minutes, right, and you have a lot of workers, that accumulates a lot of money over the year. So things that you don't have to carry around, things that can make you more hands-free, right, all these efficiencies are being explored. Um, prototype a retail space without having to build anything at all. Um, so for the sake of this car conference, right, so how, how do we use these, these as tools to, right, how do, how do we learn in the workplace in ways? And, and I'm sure you guys know this, there's a work of talent, right? It, it, it's like, it's not going to stop, it's just going to get harder, harder and harder. Uh, and, and part of my sort of personal interest is, okay, um, how do we, you know, not just look at it as talent, but actually look at how do we make people better? How do we use these technologies to make people better? Um, some good news. So this Nielsen did a study having people look at 360 content and regular content and basically found that there's a 28 times increase in retention of content with 360, which is, which is, which is kind of huge. Um, uh, Dell came out with a workforce report uh, Actually, sorry, it wasn't Dell. It was it was another company. It's a typo. Uh, it's a VR uh, VRVC firm that came out with, with a number saying, "Hey, people think the brand is more progressive when they use VR." Uh, a pretty short-term thing because it's not going to be this new thing anymore, but still a strategic opportunity to use. Um, <clears throat> this is Dell. So they did a huge study saying that, and, and they looked at specifically AI and VR, and looked at demographics and looked at, okay, how many people want to use it, who wants to use it, and 66% of the global employees wanted to use it. Um, bad news is that if you don't have decent tech, you have, right, a lot of people will want to quit if they're millennial, right, so 18 to 34, you're doubling your sort of, hey, I'm, I'm going to leave. And uh, it also influences them a lot when, when you ask them if they, they're going to take a new job, right? So that's, that's a pretty big influence. Um, so those are the opportunity territories, right? Better recall, better brand perception, better engagement with millennials. Like, what do you use for it? Right? That's where you want to be in 2017. And the technology is here already. So it's not necessarily just about the tech itself, but it's like, what do you do with it in the workplace? So um, Harvard has actually an interesting uh, case that they're doing now, right? So they say, okay, we're really picky about our people that we bring in, so how do we do this in VR, right? So now they're gonna offer the first class in VR. Personally, I don't know if that's super compelling, right? You know, when, yeah, it's like you still have a dude standing in front of you, and it, it's just like, 
it might be a novel thing, but, but they're moving there, right? That's the point. So uh, if you really want to use these technologies, you want to immerse some, you know, like with it with the IndyCar thing. Right? It's not like we had a lecture, the IndyCar driver telling you about physics. Instead, we had them experience the full on car in their dynamics. So, but it's a, it's a step in the right direction. Um, another thing we're, we're working on right now is, is to really look at how do we rethink the recruitment um, strategies, uh, how do we think about onboarding, how do we think about training. So, right, uh, in recruitment, you, if you recruit a C-level officer, it's not just him or her making decisions, it's the whole family, right? They, they want to know where they're going to live, where the kids are going to school, all that stuff. And how do you truly, how do you really take them there um, if not through this, uh, these mediums? Uh, Deutsche Bahn, huge company, uh, started doing this already. So they basically produce a bunch of content saying, just having people, hey, this is what it's like to work with us. Check it out. Like, these are the different positions. Apparently, they're a really boring company in Germany. As I get to this presentation for a German company, and everybody's so laughing. It's not going to help them, they said. But <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, again, a step in the right direction. So, you know, there's this, there's this thing that all the stuff that I told you guys about that happened before, everything from the early days, people were getting busy, all that stuff, decades of things, we sort of call it year zero, right? That's, that, was, that was year zero, that was experimentation, everything happened, and now it's year one. Now there's business models behind it, now there's applications, so we sort of, um, are looking at what are the what's really worth making in year one is the question. Right? How do we? You know, we don't want to make more. You know, there, there, arguably, you're not gonna be much better person or learn anything in a VR version of Grand Theft Auto. And and arguably, there's there's harmful effects from that. So how do we um, go in into this um, sort of wooden ethics? Perspective. And uh, that's the philosophical perspective, but also the, the feasibility and viability of things is somebody goes, well, how am I going to make money, right? And then it's kind of simple, it's like I said, right? If, 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 if you can create efficiencies and cut down time, which all of these things can, um, there's, it's just the model is fairly easy. Right? That's what it does. It's an efficiency tool in our mind. So um, I want to leave you with this quote. Um, this is Gary Kasparov getting beaten by Deep Blue the first time um, a machine beats a human in chess a few years ago. And uh, right, the point is sort of, I think we're all, people are freaking out about singularity. People are freaking out about, okay, what is all these machines are gonna, you know, me and my mom would talk today in the car about how we, you know, if the internet would go down, we'd all, right, just kind of die pretty much within a matter of, I mean, it, it's just like, it, it's, it's uh, the technology is its own thing, we can't control it, so the perspective is, right, but it's still coming, so how do we uh, learn to, to, to live with it in, uh, you know, what we call elegant coexistence? It was all, you know, just like now you have your phone in your pocket, um, it's elegant because it, it doesn't speak to you, it measures things, it, it knows things, soon it will speak to you. And um, with, with, with all of this stuff that's happening where you actually put things on your face, right? Um, how does it become a co elegant coexistence? Is that main question for us? And that's it. <laughs> As I, as yeah, yeah, so as I said in earlier uh, when I started, basically what we do is we're, we're consultancy. So we are not, I, use, I have a company, you know, we're a lot of people, we're not an agency that designs, but instead we have strategic partners. Uh, some are specialized in certain design skills, some are specialized in strategy and so forth. And what we call is we put together super teams for each project. So um, 
usually one of the problems with brands and corporations, and pretty much anyone right now, is that no one knows what to do with this. So there needs to be a learning journey that happens first. Um, because if you don't know, if you don't fundamentally understand what this does, the implications, and actually have tried the different things, it's impossible to make any decisions about content or about any sort of um, you know strategic uh, moves ahead. So what we usually start is we uh, we take uh, brand teams, organization teams through learning journey, you know one two three days, very specific curriculum, um, showing all the technologies, showing curated list of, of experiences that are relevant. Um, we did one last month where pretty much we have 20 people from Facebook, Vance, XPRIZE, City of Los Angeles, and they went through the experience. At the end of it, they created their own product, pretty much. So it's, an, it's, it's sort of the, the innovation sessions that we used to, but with a very specific lens around, uh, around this and um, accelerating meaningful content, so to say. And on their end, right, they're thinking about, okay, yeah, what are the implications for, for our pipelines, our, our processes, how does this make money, all those stuff is, 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 is something we help them with as well. The second phase, all right, so now we know this, let's say we create a prototype, what do we build, right? And that's a different team that comes in and different skill sets and so on and so forth. So um, I hope that answers your question, but pretty much we, uh, uh, we take people on expeditions have them figure stuff out, and then we, we go and build things with them. when I sunset that old company and started this new company. So the next phase of that project, so to answer your question, no. Um, because there's a lot of issues in, 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 in education. Yeah. And we just hit, we went to many walls. So we're gonna focus on, we're working on a thing with MIT now mm -hmm. to use the HoloLens instead of focus on higher education mm -hmm. first. Um, then you have adjacent possibilities design-wise, whereas if you focus on something first and you design with adjacent possibilities, you can look at, okay, what's closest to it yeah. later down the line, which is uh, K through nine or nine through 12 education, yeah. and then you have a belt that, right? So you can still design a core thing that can be applicable to uh, the other ones. And I think, exactly, exactly. So. We don't necessarily lock us lock ourselves in, but but with somebody like MIT, right, it needs to be higher ed. So, mm -hmm. But they're also very interested in in, in, in younger kids, yeah. and they is basically it's sort of age agnostic. If you will. Um, the curriculum can be uh, re repurposed later on, mm -hmm. but how we re how we interact with the interfaces, how do we uh, use the technology? It's sort of like um, the tech itself, yeah. there's little differences between an app for a kid or a high school kid and an adult. Right. So same thing here, right? It's the content, the curriculum, pedagogy will be different, but the, uh, the design it's at the its same. core is the same. Yeah. Let me just add something real quick before you guys have ending for the kids. What Victor does when you're introduced to it, Introducing him to our community and 
like even now right you have a lot yeah, it's like people it's, it's hard to know what you want uh, it, and it's even harder with these new things that people haven't tried right so so it's sort of um, you know uh, yeah I totally agree I think that's the gap we're trying to close yeah. as well so you're tying it to a purpose yeah it's yeah. sort of it's sort of right it's it's a uh, it's pretty much um, helping, I think. My background was in, uh, I was a creative director and design. We, you know, we did big campaigns and stuff like that. Uh, sold cars mm -hmm. and shoes, I mean, for big brands. But now I'm really interested in it, right? I still learn to design, but this new thing is really about, like I said before, it's not necessarily about galleries and the marketing, but how do we, how do we make people better, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's my belief that if you go work for a company, right, and, and I'm sure, you know, and then you guys all know this, right, that there's, there's, there's things that you can do, there's, you can develop, you can learn new things, and, and, and that's a big part of, I think, working for a great company means. So, um, this technology enables that in ways that nothing else could before, just like in education, uh, you know, in, in 9 to 12 that we did. So, but before we can do that, before the companies, before whoever is making the decisions can figure out what they want, what it means, then these, there's this process, exactly. There's a process you got to go through, like with everything else. And I, I think it's uh, Sheldon Milgram's um, uh, spectrum there, right? It's uh, people, and even the definition of virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, mixed reality, is, is still at a very confusing state, mm -hmm. stage for most people. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of confusion between is 360 videos flat? Is that or stereoscopic? What, right, what right, is right. What virtual reality? reality? Yeah. So, and yeah. then within that, what are the affordances of, of the, the of virtual reality, of augmented reality, and stuff? What will that give me that is unique? That I will, you know, I can come up with an experience uh, for a problem that I need to solve or for uh, uh, something that. Uh, my learners need to experience. Yeah. Now, how can I uniquely use those techniques, th those affordances, applied to that situation? Yeah. Like a simulation, for example, and all that. And uh, many people, I guess all of us, don't don't know all that is out there yet. Yeah. Or what's the best tool to do this? Yeah. Best environment. Um, how to actually get it to the hands of the learners. Exactly. Like we just ship them cardboard? Exactly. You know, yeah. Or yeah, it's a full user experience, right? Yeah. And I think we, we often think about, okay, what do you see when you put it on, which is actually part of the full experience. So you need to think about what happens before, what happens right. after. Absolutely. Um, you know, the analytics part is something we never talk about, but I think in my opinion, that's, it's a huge thing, right? It's very, very important for, for uh, you know, for people and to. Which, which yeah, what, what does it mean, right? Like, what is it? And then the, the guys that we're working with, they're working with the neuroscience team to try to start figuring out what what certain patterns in your movement means if tied to basic human emotions. Mm -hmm. So another project we're working on with, is with the LAPD in Los Angeles on uh, finding new ways to recruit police officers with VR, right? So right now I just kind of, hey, check out how much, how cool it is maybe, and then, you know, find your purpose, but down the line, what's gonna happen is that you're, as a police, as a potential recruit, you're gonna be seeing uh, certain pieces of content that will be looking at 
how you react to them mm -hmm. right. without using. So we call it like the screen watches you as well. Right now we just watch the screen, but the screen watches you as well. Mm -hmm. So you can and change we can, Yeah, exactly. So I think it's on uh, all of our interest to know that the, the guys in the, the guys and girls in the police force are there because they generally want to be there and not because they want a gun. So with all the turmoil that's happening and everything that's happening right now, that is hugely relevant yeah. thing to, to figure bias. out. Yeah, and we don't want to say like nobody wants to be, you know, hey, we have this available, we could use it, but we did. Yeah, right. It's like we're redefining what immersive really means. Like mm -hmm. Immersive learning. We've talked about immersive learning. Is just being an avatar in Second Life really immersive? Because you're a third person. You're looking at a third person. Right. Here. Now you actually get to live it inside of an environment and manipulate things. Uh, so it's, it's super practical for, for training purposes. Like yeah. the, the safe to fail, fail thing, you actually yeah. can drop a $5 million piece of equipment and not worry about it. Yeah, or blow something or up. Yeah. <laughs> or defuse a bomb. Yeah, yeah. 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 Or exactly. Or go back to a burning yeah. building. Or yeah. Yeah. one more question. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it is a kind of category of questions. I mean, there's so many. I've been looking at the Internet of Things and the you know, and, and AI really exists. One of the questions I have is, you know, everybody is worried about the singularity. You know, and there's issues, and I've read, I've read that Google is putting a, is putting a kill switch in in case it starts to go, starts to go the wrong direction. Right. Um, but I'm also wondering about the other risks. I mean, one is, you know, I have to leave my laptop up in my room because the battery dies. Yeah. You know, I, mean, there, I mean, there's a power issue yeah. in it running all of this stuff that's going to happen. And even to your mom's question of, you know, what if the day after tomorrow happens and the electrical grid on the planet goes down, yeah. what does that mean for us yeah. if we yeah. get so involved in this, you know, this type of thing? But, you know, so and then with every technology that's ever come out, whether it's the telegraph or the internet or the email, there's always that opportunity for criminal behavior to step in before we, you know, kind of get the security camera down. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering about that issue with yeah, yeah. these technologies. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, and then I, I was talking to a, a, a former client um, with a friend, and he just got, for his car, he just got a bill for an upgrade to the software in his car. Now, in with the Internet of you know, Things, yeah. if we have 57 things in our home that are all running and working together and talking to each other and all this, what happens if every every maker of those things sends a bill for $150 for an upgrade for those 57 things? Yeah. Yeah. I can't afford that. Yeah. You know, I mean, if I, th th so those affordan affordances in just the reality of electrical grid, <laughs> commerce, yeah. security. Yeah. Everybody's worried that the singularity is only five years away or 10 years away. Yeah. I mean, how much do you, do you have any idea you thought of if people are thinking about that and those other aspects? that might move that singularity out just because we just can't get there yeah, in society. Yeah. Well, I think the thing is, here's a short answer. Like, I don't yeah. have a choice, <laughs> right? We have no choice. Yeah. It's sort of, there's there's this, um, I think it's moving at its pace and there's nothing we can do to stop it. It's just our markets. Everything is, is a self fulfilling prophecy, right? You have, there needs to be phone coming out with intervals that needs to be faster, you know, and, and, and they have, I mean, my phone, I'm, I uh, just uh, I haven't upgraded, but you know it starts working poorly. Like so, it's all these mechanisms built in for technology to have its own trajectory, right? So there's nothing we can do to stop it, and that's exactly the point with this as well. Is okay, we know it's coming. What are we going to do with it? Right. Um, is the question. So you you have to have this counterbalance of, of things, right? So we're going to produce all this, you know. Gaming, entertainment, porn, which, you know, nothing was wrong with that, but there is a, we sort of discovered fire again a little bit just because mm -hmm. it, the way it makes us feel and react mm -hmm. and get present. Mm -hmm. So, how, what are the standards by which we can use it? Yeah. To uh, to your point about the internet, the cybercrime and everything, yeah. you know, I think it, it's, it's uh, you know, back when the internet came out, people were sort of, Oh, I like I can't I can't give out my address. People might come and get me, right? But you look at them now and look at what's happening now with Snapchat and Instagram and everything. Like we are giving away information for free, and we're getting it's actually a race for points, right? So we're racing to get as many likes on our pictures, 
and Snapchats. And so it's a really, it's very, very hard to predict how it's going to happen and who's going to be driving it. But it's one of those things that's inevitable that I think will happen, right? That we will be fine with yeah. it. Might, with it this. Mind, it's, it's a matter of is it this part or that part? I, I think it's going to happen. Yeah. It doesn't matter, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. is it going to happen as bad? I mean, Gart, if you look at Gartner's hype cycle on emerging technologies, yeah. I mean, it made my skin crawl <laughs> when I looked at it. I think you adapt. Like, uh, yeah. It's yeah. an ecosystem, yeah. right? So as you come up with faster phones that consume more more energy, for example, mm -hmm. more electricity, then you come up with fast chargers. That was something that didn't exist a few years ago, maybe a year ago. Uh, now you've got a fast charger that charges it faster. So at least right. the battery's yeah. still running down. Which is, yeah, so as it it creates a new markets and yeah. new products. And, and, and it pushes alternative yeah. energy. Yeah, so because, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So solar power, yeah, you know, yeah. And all that, yeah. Hey, before we run out of time, can we demo the HoloLens? Take a look. I actually didn't bring it with me, it's an empty box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so who wants to go first? Let's let Enzo do it. I just want to take a picture of it wearing it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you need a, need a video of this. <laughs> Here, with this guy. This is the video. Oh, come on. <laughs> 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 so how much is that full of lens? Uh, it's uh, it's three thousand right now, and you can only I think you can get five per person or company, or you can we can do uh, you can do like a, the other option is a hundred of them. It's either five or a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> you pay four four million and then like three hundred thousand now. So, yeah, the button is here. So you basically, the Walmart is open. You're going to see. So, so the way, whoever wants to try, so basically, this is, you know, the mouse click is this. So you put your finger up and you do this. And it sees your finger because it has onboard cameras, right? Mm -hmm. So it recognizes this gesture. So you're going to see a little small dot in front of you wherever you look, and you basically scroll with your face. And when you want to point at things, you just look at it and you make sure the dot is on there, and then you tap it, and then that's how you select the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, so you put it on, it's like a helmet in the back. And then you tighten it up like a helmet. And then uh, fix stuff. So I'm going to show, there's a ton of things. I'm going to show you the galaxy. Are you videoing this? <laughs> it doesn't look silly at all. Thank you for that. He looks fine. You're going to look silly. have a live feed of what you see here. Next year. Yeah, All right, we have Periscope. See the call outs, the different galaxies. So remember this. Sweet. <laughs> Don't crush Mars. <laughs> I'm expecting to crush Mars. Mars. This is awesome. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm looking at Trumpler 14 right now, the, the Galaxy the cluster. Reset. Grab. Grab. Yeah. Yes. And then you can, if you click on the uh, the sun, you zo you will zoom in into the uh, solar system. But if I can see the sun, where is it? <laughs> I'm here. Oh, there. Is that the sun? Or click it inside of the metal pipe. It's the big yellow one. It's <laughs> not. It's subtle. It's very. The sun is very subtle. <laughs> I think so the singularity is happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> Ready, ready, so ready, real subtle. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I don't see where's the sun to the left. Just click, click in the middle of the galaxy. In, in the middle. Of it. Yeah. Come on. I'm clicking you. Oh, now we're talking. <laughs> 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 Whoa. <laughs> Did you take a photo of this? No, you joined it. Or it didn't happen. <laughs> Somebody else want to try it? I want to try it. Fun. Wait, pose one more time. I'll get a picture for you. It looks like you're grabbing flies. <laughs> well, that worked. Well, <laughs> it did something. Do you find an Easter egg? Very nice. Oh, yeah, I did Easter egg. Was that an Easter egg? Very nice. Thank you. Yeah. So there's a. Uh, all right, who else? Okay. Okay. I don't know if I want to close this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Thomas, not to take pictures. Only if I own the camera, I can. Oh, all right. Your video. Okay. I'll just show my daughter. No video? You can. Okay. Just, and that's, that, that, that's just that's my phone. question. <laughs> my question is corrected lenses. Oh yeah, how does that sound? Yeah, you can actually put on many glasses. So it, it slides down, there is a thing, and this thing slides out. Huh. Huh. So it's not, it's not your, uh, whatever this thing I'm doing is, is like, it's, <laughs> it brings up the menu. Uh, so. I'm not just clicking the soft part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just what you just said, the I don't know if I remember all your little hand gestures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the gesture? Oh, yes. okay. So what do I do? So you look at it, you look at the little call out of the galaxy.